Rector, honored guests, my beloved friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, gut moron. Today, I'm going to talk about giving scientific credit to ordinary people who collaborate in scientific research. I want to begin by defining two terms. When I say professional science, scientist, I mean researchers with advanced degrees, like most of you, um, often employed in research institutions or universities. And I use non-academic collaborator for the research collaborators, often but not always local to the community, who do not work in research institutions and who have an ongoing and significant involvement in participatory research. Now, participatory research recognizes that all people create knowledge. In participatory research, including here at SLU in a number of departments, I'd just like to say, professional scientists do research together with local people, farmers, fishers, potato farmers in Skirna, school teachers, hotel chambermaids, as non-academic collaborators. Now, given the importance of the scientific knowledge that these non-academic collaborators bring to participatory research, my research team and I wondered whether authors of participatory research publications would recognize those collaborators with co-authorship or an explicit acknowledgment. So using a sample of 262 journal articles, oh good, that's there, excellent. Um, <coughs> I'm paleotechnic, I'm really sorry. Um, reporting participatory research on rural livelihoods published in English, which was of course a constraint, from 1975 through 2013, so it was a good long span, and 60 to 90 minute phone interviews with the lead authors of a subsample of co-authored publications, we asked three, what do I do with this thing? Do I just push it? No. Help. Oh, is it that? Ha! I did it. It's because you stood up. Otherwise, it wouldn't have moved, right? <laughs> we asked three empirical questions about co-authorship and acknowledgement practices. First, were the contrib contributions of non-academic collaborators recognized with co-authorship and or acknowledgement? Second, what factors affected the likelihood that an author, an article would be co-authored with non-academic col um, collaborators? And what reasons do professional scientists who do co-author give for doing so? Now, to be clear, I am not arguing that all participatory research, whoops, sorry, Louise missed a slide. So the second thing that we did was based on our empirical research and analysis, we asked two questions about practice, scientific practice, and thinking. And the first was, when the results of participatory research are published, how should the scientific contributions of the non-academic collaborators be credited? And second, how do the contributions of non-academic collaborators in participatory research affect our understanding of what constitutes science? So just to be clear, I am not arguing that all participatory research should be co-authored nor am I arguing that every single person who participates in research should be a co-author, but what I am arguing is that co-authorship needs to be discussed from the beginning of any research project. So this talk proceeds in three parts. First, I, fr <coughs> excuse me, I frame the discussion with a few thoughts on what constitutes science and a quick consideration of the issues in giving scientific credit. Second, I prevent, present our findings, the whole research team you saw on the first slide, on patterns of authorship and acknowledgement practices by professional researchers in, <coughs> researchers in our sample. And third, I will discuss some implications of our research. So the authorship of scholarly publications is arguably the most widely recognized currency in the academy. <coughs> 
and a significant factor in who is recognized professionally as a scientist. Anybody in here who's a research professor who's never published an article? No. OK. As participatory research methods have been accepted in mainstream academics, government, and non-governmental non research institutions, the increase in publications based on participatory research has raised questions about crediting the contributions of non-academic collaborators. Who gets to be an author has significant implications for whose knowledge is recognized as scientific. So if I'm going to talk about scientific contributions, I must address the question, what is science anyway? So science, very briefly, can be defined both in terms of its goal, better accounts of the world, and in terms of its methods, experimentation and observation. While traditionally both natural and social scientists have held that professional accreditation is required to be a scientist, in the context of participatory research, professional scientists depend on the scientific knowledge of their non-academic collaborators. That knowledge has not been and probably could not be produced within the confines of professional science. So although the scientific validity of community people's knowledge has long been demonstrated, professional scientists have often failed to recognize it. This is part of a more general pattern of exclusion in the scientists based on social characteristics, gender and race being the prime examples, and I will return to this point. The use of social characteristics in shaping notions of objective scientific knowledge, what is objective knowledge, and therefore, who is a scientist, has been questioned by Donna Haraway, who famously argued that all knowledge, all knowledge, including scientific knowledge, is situated, embodied, and partial. And what I want you to concentrate on is that knowledge <clears throat> is partial. So the obvious corollary that science is that science that excludes researchers on the basis of social characteristics runs the risk of missing important knowledge. Participatory researchers att intentionally attempt to combine their own partial knowledge with the partial knowledge of their non-academic collaborators in order to co-create better accounts of the world. That is, participatory researchers recognize that their non-academic collaborators know things that they, the professional scientists, do not. And we have two honorary doctors this morning who are not professional researchers, but boy, do they know a lot, right? So they know, therefore, they will do better scientific research when working with non-academic collaborators than doing research on their own. And here's an example of how this works. Professional scientists did research together with Yupik whalers using the whalers' traditional knowledge of bowhead whales in the northern Bering Sea to study migratory patterns, seasonal distribution, and changes over time in bowhead whale abundance and distribution. Now, consistent with scientific practice, Whaler's traditional knowledge is built on detailed observations of specific phenomena, and its holders also, as we do, recognize patterns and connections that define the environmental system of what there is a part. Now, further, the importance of traditional knowledge for safety and hunting success places a premium on care and honesty when conveying information. Lives may be at stake. So observation and interpretation must be and are rigorous. 
So a lot more is at stake here, people's lives are at stake, than publishing another refereed journal article. No lives have been at stake. Anybody got an article where lives were at stake? No, okay. So now I'm gonna discuss some feminist theory, which some of you may find unsettling. So just brace yourself, it'll be okay. Berenice Carroll asserts that there is a class system of the intellect that <clears throat> privileges first-rate original thought generally attributed to white men over the thought and knowledge of other people. While Carroll focused on the devaluation of the work of women scholars, her argument extends to others, including non-academic collaborators. She argues that this system operates in <coughs> substantial measure on various forms of appropriation, that is taking, of the mental and physical labor of those relegated to the lower classes. So in a word, Carol is talking about theft, specifically intellectual theft, which is a profoundly unjust and unethical scholarly practice. Okay, let me see. Epistemic justice, this is the only big word I'm gonna use, I promise. So Miranda Fricker, who is an English philosopher, illuminates the, the underpinnings of this practice of theft with her concept of epistemic injustice, which means someone has been wrongly rejected as not being capable of knowing something. In the failure to acknowledge the intellectual contributions of non-academic collab non -academic collaborators, we see both the theft of their knowledge by professional scientists and a kind of epistemic injustice, try to use this today and impress your friends, that occurs when someone is judged based on social characteristics, not to be a credible source of knowledge. So this constitutes harm both to the individual, who's gonna listen to me, I'm a woman, and to others who share that devalued, have I done something bad with the, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. See, deans are extremely important parts of the university. <laughs> oh, and the rectors too. <laughs> thank you. Um, so people who share the devalued social characteristics, commonly, Gender, race, social class, and age, both kids and old people are considered suspect, and in the present case, professional scientific credentials. Fricker is clear that the consequence of using social characteristics to judge the credibility of someone's knowledge is to miss out on a truth, which is exactly what Donna Haraway said. So think of those whalers, had the professional scientists not done research with them, they would not have understood the bowhead system. So now let's look at some empirical results answering, answering question one, were the contributions of non-academic collaborators recognized with co-authorship or acknowledgement? I begin with the finding that only 16 at 6% of the 262 articles in our sample of participatory research were collaborated, were co-authored with the non-academic collaborators. 6%? That's scandalous. That's just downright scandalous. Out of the 262 articles, professional scientists acknowledged their contributions in an acknowledgement system 51% of the time, which is also not very impressive. If your research depends on the knowledge of your collaborators, why would you not acknowledge them? We would not do that to our professional colleagues. Why do we feel it's okay to do it to our non-professional colleagues? 
So this is looking a lot like intellectual theft. The second empirical question, what factors affected the livelihood, the likelihood that the article would be co-authored? The first was participatoriness. It's a word I made up. It's kind of like googliness that they evaluate Google employees on. So all articles were scored from one to four on a participatory scale, and we hypothesized that the more participatory research, the more participatory research was, the more likely the, the article would be co-authored. And we were right. So this was, for those of you who do stats, significant and positive effect. And all our numbers are, are the, from which we did using R, are in the article, so you can read them. <clears throat> so the research team interpreted this to mean that researchers who are more dedicated to facilitating community member participation in all members' dimensions of the research process, including data analysis, writing, and publication, are more likely to co-author. In other words, sustained and close involvement with the community is important. The second factor was fo focus on indigenous people, which also had a positive and significant effect in predicting co-authorship. So research done with indigenous people was more likely to be co-authored. Now this may reflect the fact that questions of authorship and intellectual property are increasingly foregrounded in collaborations with indigenous groups, many of whom now have their own research review boards as well. It may also reflect the ethical standards <coughs> of researchers who work in these communities. Two things that did not affect this at all was the institution of the lead author and the journal in which it was published. The journal had a, it wasn't significant, but it was, you know, kind of lurking out there. Now, I've lost page 13. That's very interesting. Oh, yep, there it is. I don't have any quantitative data on why researchers did not co-author. And that's something I would really like to do further research on. These barriers, both up here and that I'm going to discuss, are from our interviews with researchers and from literature. One issue that stops people from co-authoring is the standards for publication in referee journal articles, many of which require co-authors to participate in writing, that is putting pen to paper in academic English. And those of us who work in African villages or elsewhere know people don't do that. Some of my colleagues don't do that. I didn't say that. Other journals may refuse collective co-authors such as villagers Although the physics journals very cheerfully accept collective co-authors, Fermilab, in, in high energy physics. So those different kinds of who's allowed to be a collective author is worth some more exploring. Promotion and tenure committee in the lead author's institution, they only count sole authored publications. So this is something that we definitely need to be introspective about. How do universities work and research institutions work to suppress co-authorship by non-academic collaborators? Now the third empirical question was what reasons do to professional scientists give for doing so? Oh, it worked, goody. Um, so, Sigari Ramdas is a veterinarian, folks, those of you who are veterinarians, and she actually was the founder of Anthros, which is a feminist participatory livestock research organization. They do amazing work. 
So she said, the whole genesis of the entire region itself was co-conceptualized with the people from the community. For us, it was very clear from the outset that the people would be co-authors. So recognizing what those folks have contributed. A second factor was research ethics. Romy Grimer from Australia said, I think it's important to acknowledge the often substantive role of people other than narrow team members play. Authorship is due recognition. <clears throat> and the Australians do some amazing research with ranchers, with Aboriginal communities. So notice the plagiarizing our professional colleagues. How many people have been plagiarized? I have. Nobody? Yeah. Were you furious? Yes. That's not OK. We don't allow that. So, so should stealing the ideas of our non-academic colleagues be unethic, considered unethical. The third part was decolonizing the research process. There's a history, particularly in the global south. But here in Sweden, we certainly know with the Sami, uh, in my own country, with Native Americans, poor communities of researchers swooping in, extracting information, and leaving quickly, often doing cultural, environmental, economic, health, and other kinds of things which are detrimental to the, to the community. Some of the participatory researchers we interviewed deliberately used research processes that would lead to community healing and overcome the legacy of such colonial research practices. So what does this mean for practice and how we think about science? That there may be very good reasons that individuals and communities would not want to be considered authors of an academic paper. The notion that non-academics are not interested in author credit cannot remain the default assumption of professional sciences. We, that is my research team and I, <coughs> believe that to deepen the practice of participatory research, co-authorship should be a required topic of discussion between professional scientists and their non-academic collaborators. If co-authorship is never discussed, can the research be considered truly participatory? Discussing co-authorship allows participatory researchers to decide collectively how credit, authority, and responsibility should be shared equitably among those who contributed knowledge, insights, and writing in the production of a research article. How people think about science, white coat, lots of glassware, is that science? Determines how the merit of scientific communities, I'm sorry, contributions by a non-academic collaborator will be judged, and by whom? We, again, my research team and I, take issue with the stance that only professional scientists may decide who is and who is not a co-author, which is what most journal standards currently do, including the Vancouver Protocol of Biophysical Research. We call for discussions among all research collaborators, not academics included. <clears throat> I conclude by posing an ethical and scientific imperative addressing the so what question that may be trembling on your lips. Politically and ethically, sci and scientifically, co-authorship can stand, to serve to stand Carroll's class system of the intellect on its head by recognizing the scientific co contributions to research by people who are not formally credentialed by the academy. Again, following Carroll, co-authorship recognizes that not all the intellectual labor underpinning the research article involves ink, setting ink to page. Think again of the Yupik whalers. Nor should writing be privileged 
as a precondition for authorship. Shifting the meaning of authorship from the physical act of writing to the distribution of authority and accountability in the creation of knowledge is a critical opportunity for rethinking what science is and who can participate in it. This position involves both the right of the non-academic collaborators to have their scientific contributions and authority recognized, and the duty of the professional researcher to recognize both their contributions and their authority. As George Huntington, a very influential Arctic researcher, has astutely observed, few scientists would be happy seeing their data published under another's name. We're back at plagiarism. Epistemic injustice, epistemic justice, sorry, requires that we do not use social characteristics to evaluate credibility. Good science requires that we be inclusive in the use of systematic observation and experimentation to create better accounts of the world. Good science combined with epistemic justice requires us to abandon the assumption that only professional scientists have the right to judge what is science and who can contribute to science. When the scientific contributions and authority of non-academic collaborators are recognized under conditions of their own choosing, co-authorship can work both towards epistemic justice and better scientific practice. And let me repeat that, and better scientific practice. This is why giving scientific credit where credit is due matters deeply. These are the links to the article, both in English and in French. I'm very proud of that, that it's also in French. Talk to Miket, thank you very much.